Thema heute ist äh, Migrating Business Critical Enterprise äh, Applications to AWS. Yeah? And thank you for uh, coming here today. So, what do we want to expect uh, from you? Uh, what, what do we want to achieve today? So, uh, we want you to learn from our experience um, and benefit from uh, our approach we took in migrating this uh, business critical enterprise application uh, into the cloud. Yeah. Uh, we as Struer Digital are facing typical challenges um, and were able to successfully uh, make important steps uh, toward the cloud uh, with CloudReach uh, as a partner. And one thing, uh, one important thing is that it's never about uh, just the migration, it's also about a transformation and a change of mindset. So let me first introduce our uh, company a bit. So uh, Ströer is a German MDAX company uh, comprised of many subsidiaries. Uh, we are leader in uh, providing digital and out of form uh, advertising solutions. Uh, maybe you have even seen our uh, brand at the main train station when you arrived for the summit today. Um, Ströer is present at over 100 locations uh, throughout Europe and uh, our digital reach is more than 53 Uh, unit users per month. And we are one of the subsidiaries of uh, Ströer Digital Media. Right, just a few things about Glarbeach. Um, yeah, so we support the project. Um, we are a leading provider of software enabled cloud services. So what does that mean? Uh, we try to um, support cl clients with the intelligent cloud adoption uh, using creating smart code. Um, within three sort of fields. First is we enable, um, so uh, cloud platforms are very powerful, but they're meaningless unless you enable the client. So enablement is our first sort of domain that we um, work in. Secondly, we integrate, so we have all kinds of expertise and tools that we can use to integrate applications and processes for you. Uh, we can help you there. And thirdly, we do operations. Uh, so we, we do uh, the ITIL-based management within, within the cloud for you, uh, as well as more agile uh, approaches to operations as well. Okay, sorry. Um, now I would like to present to you to Lars. Hi. Hi, everybody. Yeah. Senior Operations Manager at Stro Digital, um, working in the beautiful city of Hamburg, my hometown. And um, Lars is one of the main drivers within Stro to actually push forward with a public cloud um, idea within Stro. Um, and um, he's pretty much a fan of AWS, if I may say so, I think. Yeah. Um, And he has actually been a user of the cloud since 2011 already. So he knows his stuff. Well, for this project, he was the technical lead um, that we started to support in Q4 last year. And this has been his baby since the beginning on. So uh, he's massively contributed to making it a success. Uh, also, as I said, because he's actually on his way to becoming a very cloudy person. Very, very cloud-native guy. Thank you, Oliver. Um, so uh, let me quickly introduce uh, you. So uh, Oliver was uh, assigned to us as a cloud engagement um, uh, manager yeah, from CloudReach. And uh, you can think of him as a uh, yeah, high-level uh, cloud project manager. Yeah, so um, he's very passionate about uh, cloud technologies. And uh, yeah, he probably liked uh, visit, uh, visiting us uh, in our new offices in Hamburg, right? In the Hafen City, Oliver? That's a great location. That's yeah, right. I agree. That's a great location. Okay, so without uh, further ado, um, let me um, tell you what, what my team actually does. So we operate um, yeah, our backend systems from Steuer Digital, uh, we have on premises. Um, AWS and uh, content management delivery systems and we manage that with a, a very small team um, out of Hamburg. Yeah. Our spectrum ranges from microservices, architectures, uh, custom APIs to enterprise grade level applications. Yeah. And uh, we also interface with uh, internal departments 
and service providers to provide a sort of uh, yeah, a collaboration and knowledge exchange there. And we also can consult in, in uh, technical areas. So, so um, now you know us a little better. Uh, let me um, come to the uh, challenge. Yeah. So first, uh, the industry challenge. Um, so you have to imagine one day management comes to you and asks you, okay, we have acquired some new companies yeah, and now uh, you have to integrate them into uh, our uh, technical environment yeah, and bring them onto our platform. So uh, by the way, these, there may be some performance issues and time is very short for that. Can you do that? Okay, so um, in generally the challenge was to unify externally and internally uh, developed um, software systems onto one target platform. Yeah? Um, so um, during that uh, process we were also looking at increased uh, backend processing times. Yeah? Um, we were having uh, more and more data influx into the systems and um, we were also looking at uh, possible resizing of the tar target platform. So, in many areas, those uh, acquired companies brought some redundant systems into the mix. Yeah? So, uh, we also had to, to look at, okay, what kind of uh, redundancy do we have there? Yeah? So, do we actually need all those systems that are, uh, that are uh, being acquired? Yeah? So, uh, in most of, most of the cases, uh, that's a no. So the um, next challenge is the applica application migration challenge. So we were migrating an ERP system. So what does the system actually do? Yeah, you might ask yourself. So it's a third party developed system. Yeah, uh, and it's used for the complete uh, business life cycle. So um, there's a sales funnel, of course, with uh, proposals and offers. Yeah, we have uh, business partner, partner data in there. Um, ad operations, um, they manage their campaigns yeah, within that system. So what they do is actually they come to work in the morning and the first thing they uh, do is check their campaigns uh, with this uh, system actually. So um, uh, in that regard it's very important. And also um, controlling and finance, they do their uh, invoicing and uh, financial projections in there and um, also do like financial reporting. Yeah. So um, we have um, a lot of uh, branch offices that are using the system uh, together with uh, road warriors like on a sales pitch or whatever and um, so the system is constantly in use yeah. and either there's uh, people using that or data processing takes place. So essentially this app can never be down. So it's, it's very important for our business. So, and then you might just ask yourself additionally, so what was uh, the reason for migrating this? Yeah? Uh, why, why does it not stay like it was? So um, sadly we cannot show you the old architecture today because it's uh, confidential. Um, uh, or you could say it grew on its own. Um, of, in German you would say historisch uh, gewachsen. And there are probably a lot of you who have um, Heard that particular term. So no, but honestly, um, we were looking at the end of life uh, for the uh, old architecture, and um, we did a risk assessment, and it indicated that um, the old uh, environment needed re-architecting anyway. Yeah? So we took the chance and uh, looked again at all our options. So um, now we are already going to come to the uh, solution part. So uh, we will show you uh, the solution uh, in detail. So what we did is we split the solution into seven phases, actually. So the first phase was uh, the design phase. Um, by analyzing the current state of the application, um, I created an optimized uh, re-platform design yeah, for the target application. Uh, the, the design objectives were high availability, and uh, for tolerance, for that matter. Uh, there were others, but those were the most, most prominent. Um, and then we quickly came to a crossroads uh, because we were looking at uh, three separate options. Yeah. 
Option one was to keep the uh, hardware uh, we already had for that particular system and uh, invest uh, into that hardware in terms of more storage, uh, more computing power, um, maybe uh, the data center layout, yeah, optimize that a bit. Um, option two was we um, were thinking about a managed hosting provider um, where we can uh, give that system, who we can give that system and professionally manage that. Yeah, maybe uh, there are a lot of providers out there who, who can do that very well. So we would give uh, the operating system and the hardware maintenance uh, into professional hands. And option three was uh, the public cloud. So after careful consideration, the decision was made that uh, we should migrate to the public cloud because uh, that is what you normally do these days and apply the re-platform approach. In collaboration with AWS and our uh, account manager, uh, the original design was also reviewed uh, by a solution architect so that we uh, made sure that this uh, is sound. And we can always recommend to uh, let, the, let the design double check by a uh, solution architect. So phase two was uh, a proof of concept phase. Yeah. So after we uh, had the design we wanted to implement, we uh, did a proof of concept environment uh, on AWS, yeah, which uh, ran with reduced resources and uh, no, no high availability in place. And that, so we wanted to make sure that the application actually works on AWS. So internally, we conducted that uh, proof of concept and strong collaboration with uh, our application providers and uh, the business owners of the project. So, and after that, um, yeah, we quickly uh, realized that we uh, needed a partner for that. Um, why? Uh, because um, at that point in time, we had uh, limited uh, in-house uh, capacity to build a, a production-ready landing zone in AWS. And we were also looking for someone with uh, in-depth knowledge um, of AWS and uh, Microsoft uh, technology. And uh, CloudReach was in the end a good fit, so because uh, the project was a success. So, uh, Oliver, can you show us now um, the remaining phases of the project from your point of view? Of course. Thank you very much, Lars. Okay. Thank you. So, um, let me just give you a quick overview of what happened after Stir had already completed their initial design phase, supported by AWS, and their PUC phase, which actually demonstrated a very high level of engagement already, which is really good. Uh, so we came in to, with an engineer and myself to do three things basically to actually come up with a high level design formalization of the designs more or less created but extend them of course to prepare for a production ready environment. Uh, we delivered the building obviously of the, of the landing phase, uh, landing zone and we supported the testing, the migration um, preparation as well as the migration itself, obviously. Um, so note that in addition to the cloud competencies, of course, we had an engineer who was capable of managing the uh, Microsoft um, uh, AD as well as the SQL servers. Um, so that was the scale we were looking at um, when we started the project. Um, in uh, phase three and four, we did that. So phase three, the design phase, so sort of review of the existing designs. Uh, took us about two weeks with multiple workshops um, and iterations. We um, really had a starting point here again. So the engagement was uh, was doing well initially because of the previous work delivered by Stura independently of us. Um, so we uh, so we had a good starting base. Um, so two weeks for the design phase, basically to create the HOD high level design documentation. Uh, and then we uh, started the uh, production uh, of, of so, sorry, the build phase. Again, it took us about five weeks to complete that. Um, and we used an agile development approach to uh, successfully complete that phase. We also used a couple of smart tools that uh, is something that Cloud is, is, is also very, very proud of. Um, for instance, we've been using Scepter for this project. 
uh, something that helps you accelerate the phase massively. Um, right, and another point to note here is that during the build phase, we also onboarded the third party engineering team to be able to actually, to obviously, be able to work with the environment as well. Um, the fifth phase was the testing phase, uh, which we supported, so testing of connectivity back to on prem environments. Um, testing infrastructure as well as the application level by end users. Sorry. Uh, and then we were able to start with migration planning and doing dry runs, which is actually uh, quite demanding here because we have a lot of parties involved, a lot of users. You need to find a good um, time slot where you can actually do the migration that was demanding. Um, so during the migration dry runs, we tested how long migration would take obviously to be able to find a good spot for that and in parallel we also onboard the cloud reach operations to the uh, to the environment uh, obviously that's something you should do before you go live we did complete that phase as well uh, before the final uh, before the sixth phase um, so then we did the actual migration together at some Friday I think it was a crunch time yeah. it was crunch time yeah um, and immediately after the migration was done, CloudReach operations took over all operational duties um, right away. Right? And then finally, we had a stabilization phase for about three months, uh, in which we actually analyzed performance data and optimized instance type sizing, etc., uh, scale infrastructure energy, that is to say, but it's also a stabilization phase uh, here that is recommended. Yeah. So next, last, we'll walk you through the solution design, give you some more insights to this how you actually build the application. Yeah, thank you, Oliver. So uh, you probably already saw the next slide. So this is what the system looked like before the project. Uh, so a traditional server rack. And I will now show you what we changed in this uh, regard. So we are in Germany here. So we really like uh, German data centers, right? So. Uh, we decided for EU Frankfurt region, EU Central one, uh, as a uh, platform for the new environment. So we started out with three availability zones uh, in that region. So in that particular region, we provisioned a VPC, typical VPC, uh, spanning those three AZs, and uh, within with a customer gateway for uh, external connectivity. So next step is to uh, connect the branch offices and um, a redundant site-to-site -site connection uh, was created to our core network and to our main branch office. Yeah? And we thank the Ströer IT for that, who implemented that in a timely manner. Yeah? So the other offices are connected through a central hub uh, so that we don't have to create uh, that many uh, VPN connections. Yeah? And the management overhead is uh, kept at a minimum. So in a, since we are in a Microsoft environment, we need, uh, first we need an Active Directory service yeah, for that uh, particular environment to function properly. Yeah. It's needed for user and computer authentication and also runs a DNS service. This may be later upgradable to AWS directory services, but we haven't looked uh, into that. So we kept it with EC2 for the time being. Yeah. And trust support may also be implemented at a later stage. So the heart of the new environment, of the production environment, is the MSSQL cluster with always on availability group. So, and we used the uh, latest official marketplace AMI for that. So you see that it's provisioned throughout all the three availability zones in this case. So if one availability zone fails, then we still have the active backup there to uh, continue our business. Right. So we, have, we also use Microsoft Analytics, yeah, which is here uh, added as a standalone instance. And uh, the web app app uh, application server uh, is provisioned inside an auto scanning group so that um, yeah, we can easily scale horizontally. Yeah. That's uh, run in the .NET code. So here I've depicted uh, the typical communication path uh, between uh, branch office and uh, yeah, the actual uh, application. So the communication goes through the internal uh, load balancer 
yeah, spreads that onto uh, how many uh, web app servers we have, and then those are connected to an AG listener who is there for a high availability connection to the database. We also have some wrapper instances that provide uh, API access in and out of the environment. Uh, for example, to our CRM system like Salesforce, which is also running in its own cloud. Um, last but not least, uh, Microsoft Remote Desktop Gateway is provisioned as a central point of authentication yeah, into that environment. At this, and this central point of authentication also enables uh, logging and uh, auditing capabilities, which make us potentially ready for GDPR. And on occasion, a uh, remote admin connects to that gateway and performs administrative tasks. So um, our backups are securely stored in uh, S3 using KMS encryption, uh, the encryption service of AWS. And we use a VPC endpoint to uh, pump our backup, backups into S3, so our data actually never uh, leaves that region. Yeah. So it's securely transferred to S3 and not via the public internet. That's an important point here. Uh, finally, we've implemented Amazon SES, an uh, often underrated service in my opinion, and we use that um, to its full potential to provide our, delivering our business emails um, which are used for invoicing and credit notes. And by using that service, we were able to, uh, without any problem, implement domain keys and DMARC rules so that actually our invoices uh, do not go into any spam folder at the client side. So if you don't know that service, have a look, and yeah, it will probably make you much happier. So yeah, th this shows the complete architecture of uh, the ERP stack. So next, I want to uh, highlight another short uh, technical project highlight, which is uh, hybrid DNS. So in my uh, humble opinion, this is a, a typical reference implementation of DNS you would find uh, in this particular setup with a remote connectivity and one account. So again, we have our uh, VPC inside uh, the AWS public cloud and a customer gateway. So within that uh, VPC, we have a private subnet, of course, where the instances are provisioned, and a DC that acts as a DNS server as well. So whenever an instance wants to perform a DNS query and communicate to another instance inside, inside that environment, well, it simply performs a DNS query against that domain controller, and the result is uh, given back. So the same thing happens on our uh, Struer side. Yeah? So again, we have a domain controller, a client performs the DNS lookup, and nothing special to it, right? So, but if we want to, if you want that to work over the uh, AWS Struer boundary, we have to conditionally forward uh, the target do zones for that uh, environment. Yeah? In this case, it's called uh, forest.local. So we now can uh, perform DNS resolution across uh, those uh, boundaries. Right? And now we're finished, right? So, or, so everything does work, right? Uh, not quite. So we, we still have no access to Route 53 private zones yeah, inside AWS. So whenever we want to look up another service, um, we, have, we do not have the capability. So what we need to do is we need another conditional forwarding to the um, Route 53 endpoints, which are automatically provisioned for you inside uh, each private subnet. So now every, every solution, every DNS resolution works. And the public lookup is just here given for completeness. Uh, it simply queries uh, Route 53 over the uh, public internet, and you get back uh, a an DNS answer. And of course, you can do that in both directions. We, we, we don't do that uh, at our site right now. But if you want to work that uh, vice versa, you have basically the same uh, option there. So, and of course, we also 
forward the reverse zones, yeah, which is uh, oft, often forgotten uh, during such an implementation. Yeah. Okay, so, and you can ask questions about that later. We will be uh, standing by the side if you have any questions. So uh, let me now com come to the comparison uh, uh, before and after. Yeah. So here I'm, I'm not going to present you every uh, aspect of it. Yeah, you can see it for yourselves. I'm giving you a few uh, highlights. Yeah, so we have now version controlled infrastructure, which is uh, very important for us because we now have uh, insight into every change that is being performed by either us or CloudReach. Right? So we can definitely um, review that every change. So, um, and about availability, the high avail available design. Um, it is uh, after the migration, we have been looking at 100% availability for that particular system. Yeah. So, uh, we are very happy about that. And in terms of security, we uh, use encryption uh, at rest and in transit. Also, one thing that uh, CloudReach was able to, the CloudReach developer was able to implement. Um, Another thing I wanted to uh, talk about is uh, a fast-paced security patching cycle. Yeah. So um, maybe you remember the meltdown and Scepter uh, security nightmare a couple of uh, months ago, where we actually had uh, the task of patching every instance uh, uh, who run on like Intel CPUs. Yeah. So that was a very big impact for everyone, I guess. And Using uh, CloudReach operations, we were able to implement that uh, very fast, in my opinion. Yeah? So we, it took us around two to three weeks to fully patch uh, both uh, test and production environments. Uh, so um, maybe you can ask yourself if your ERP system is already patched or um, yeah, if it's still ongoing. So among others, there are also some business benefits. We now have full cost transparency into the environment uh, where we, uh, there are no hidden costs. Uh, um, we can see what, what's going on. We uh, definitely know what, what every instance uh, costs us. So, um, and also we can react very fast to changes. Um, if, if we should need more CPU capacity or more storage capacity, we can provision that instantly and almost um, yeah, in an unlimited fashion. So Oliver, <laughs> it's your turn again. So can you please uh, show us uh, some success factors and risk factors um, that uh, we reached during that project phase? Sure. Thanks. So I've just bulleted a couple of things that we, we believe are important to successfully completing immigration. So, um, First of all, you should try to understand why you do the migration. So why do you want to move into the cloud? So that's number one, I guess. So there's a couple of categories that the reasons to bring fall into. And it's IT modernization, so reduce technical doubt, improve scalability, reliability, etc. There is secondly agility you want to aim for, um, so reduce time to market, uh, etc. Thirdly, cost savings uh, with the pay-as-you-go model, optimizing utilization of resources, etc. And fourth, innovation to create additional value from using technology within the cloud. Um, so first, try to understand why you want to move forward. Knowing the why typically helps you to determine the different migration path, so the, the uh, six R's, per application or per application component. And it really helps you to uh, come up with a good decision as to whether you migrate first and optimize later, or whether you apply the uh, greenfield and refactoring approach. In any case, um, don't just move the application, sorry, move the application, not just the service. Yeah? That's, that's, that's always the case. Um, secondly, it's never about migration only. It's always about transformation as well. So there's always new skills required um, uh, to be able to manage the problem. There's always new tools required. There's always also new governance required that you need to adapt to, new processes, and also new ways of financially operating uh, your state. So it's always, always about transformation as well. So you need to have strong change management of players to be able to 
get your whole team in, into the right direction. Uh -huh. um, so, and then some some more practical things. So, here in this example, the client girl was already pretty much engaged when we started the project together. So, doing uh, an initial design phase, supported by your AWS solution architect, and also doing a hands-on PLC phase is, I think, a very good idea to start off with. Um, and then once that phase is done, you can bring in someone like CloudReach, of course, you can start earlier, but you can bring us in at that point in time to really help you with the automation and the coding to, to really productionize the whole, uh, the whole idea. Yeah? Um, and then one final thing that I think is important is to create a developer-friendly environment, um, which is agile, typically. Um, and yeah, open communication paths between all parties involved. Yeah? Just a few points that I think are important. Um, then maybe something that is also interesting for you is what we think is um, uh, sort of critical and what almost went wrong. Sort of. So we had the issue of actually planning the migration um, time slot. Pretty much so, it sort of was quite a demanding task because of all the stakeholders involved here. And so the overlap between the business processes, like release cycles, what the, you know, what the um, application owner side wanted in terms of feature uh, you know, deployment, and finding a good slot in time with all the parties involved to be able to do the migration together. That was quite challenging. Then we had a couple of problems with the allocation of contractor resources here, I think. Yeah. Um, getting them into the project at the right point in time, uh, not just the migration itself, but also the full. Uh, yeah, right. Um, then there is this sort of conflict between, um, it's a conflict in mindset between developing features and non-functional features, right? Functional features versus not functional features. Um, most people that are usually involved in maintaining and sort of um, managing the European application, yeah, they're usually feature-oriented, right? right? So it takes, it takes some, some efforts to get everyone involved um, onto the same level, uh, also taking non-functional requirements into consideration. Uh, um, so everyone has to adopt the mindset a bit. Yeah, yeah so... Um so, oh, the yeah. just yeah, just Sorry. a couple of things that we think are critical here for this type of project. Um, so, finally, Lars, can you give us an overview over what's ahead of Sure now? What's what's the uh, cloud adoption strategy? Yeah, gladly. And this will be our uh, last slide. So, um, we also have been looking at the big picture of the cloud adoption. So. Um, What's, what are the next steps for us? Yeah? So first, we, of course, we need to continuously refactor the uh, environment yeah? and optimize, uh, for example, for costs and uh, usage. Yeah? So we, we refactor inside AWS. Um, additionally, we have some ongoing cloud project. For example, uh, Redshift yeah? is being adopted as a data warehouse. And maybe you, someone of you saw Ian Robinson's talk yesterday, which was very good about uh, AWS components, about data warehouses. And we also evaluate uh, cloud native, cloud first, and serverless approach. Yeah. Uh, our company also embraces data-driven approach. So every new piece of data that we, that we generate, uh, we try to factor into uh, our new projects and new developments. Yeah. And I hope everybody of you does that too. So um, additionally, we are looking at the evaluation of a cloud center of excellence, um, which would give us uh, some advantages over the current process. So um, we wanted to use a platform level approach where we can actually consolidate all our assets we, we have um, on AWS. And, and here, I, mean, I don't mean um, uh, Struer Digital alone. I also mean uh, it's many subsidiaries which are already successful uh, using AWS uh, in that regard. They may be either a startup or they may be a company uh, which has been there for a long time. So we try to um, transfer knowledge internally 
and keep the discussion going of what can be improved. Yeah. So, and everything we cannot, uh, I honestly have to say, everything we cannot um, put on AWS, we are also you're working at a multi-cloud approach where we um, adopt other uh, cloud vendors and look at if they um, give us a better service in that area or um, if we have some um, yeah, benefits by imp implementing it differently on other clouds, right? So, yeah, and this was basically it. I hope uh, you took something from it, yeah? So how we uh, approached that um, migration and yeah, we will be available uh, at the site for uh, some Q&As. And yeah, thank you for your attention.